Great, looks like streaming has started. So welcome everyone. Um, today is, uh, I'm State Senator Mark Cran. Today is uh, February 25th and we'll call the order on the Legislative Audit Commission. And uh, we have uh, just one agenda item today. It's the report of the briefing on the emergency ambulance services. And with that, Ms. Randall, would you like to kick us, up, kick us off? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. For the record, my name is Judy Randall, Legislative Auditor, and I'm pleased to be here today to release our evaluation on emergency ambulance services. Um, thank you. Also, I know this is two in one week, and it takes a lot of time for all of you. So um, thank you for, um, for making the time to hear this um, evaluation. When people in Minnesota have a medical emergency, they dial 911 and expect an ambulance to arrive on the scene shortly thereafter. While this is typically the case, the level of service and how long it takes for the ambulance to arrive varies depending on where in the state you're located. The way Minnesota structures and regulates ambulance services has basically been the same since the 1980s. It's now the 2020s and a lot of things have changed. Um, we've had changes in healthcare, we've had changes in transportation, we've had changes in communication, IT technology, etc. Um, and of course, population growth. But the way we deliver ambulance services in the state is still based on the framework we established in the 1980s. So in other words, in a time, it was a different time, a different era. Our team looked at that framework and we also looked at the emergency medical, medical, emergency medical services regulatory board, wanted to make sure I got it right, EMSRB, um, which is the regulatory agency that oversees these services. Um, and we think it is time to consider significant changes. Um, our, our evaluation identified a number of serious concerns regarding emergency ambulance services. Some of our findings will require legislative action. Many of them will require action by the board. And I, I wanna emphasize for you all, this is an important report with a number of important findings, findings and a large number of important recommendations. We think it's going to require significant attention from the legislature to, to make improvements. Um, so with that, that um, kind of important message, I really am trying to underscore that this is, this is a big report with big findings. I'd like to turn to uh, Mr. David Kirchner, who was the manager for this evaluation. Thank you, Thank Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Randall. And uh, Mr. Kirchner, before we move forward, um, Ms. Gilb, could we uh, do roll call, please? Good afternoon, this is Shelly Gilb, and I'll take the roll. Senator Curran? Here. Senator Benson? Representative Bernardi? Here. Representative Erickson? Uh, Erickson present. Senator Frentz? Representative Hansen? Present. Senator Kiffmeyer? Present. Senator Klein? Representative Liebling? Present. Representative Pearson? Representative Quam? Present. Senator Rest? That ends the roll. Excellent. Thank you, Ms. Gilb, and thank you for your patience, Mr. Kirshner. So, um, Mr. Kirshner, um, you're up next. Please state your name and your position, and, and then the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is uh, David Kirshner. I'm uh, with the Legislative Auditor's Office. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here, and I, before I get going too far, I want to make sure that uh, uh, you can all see that. So, uh, Are you able to see uh, the screen? Yes, I see thumbs up, so great. Uh, before I, uh, and before, also before I get started, I would like to acknowledge um, the other members of the uh, evaluation team. The reports that we present to you are always a team effort, and I would like to uh, acknowledge the hard work of Gretchen Becker, Ryan Moltz, and Catherine Tyson, who are the other three members of our evaluation team. Let me start by briefly noting our key findings that I'm gonna walk through over the course of this presentation. 
Uh, generally speaking, we have uh, concerns about the process by which ambulance services are assigned to geographic areas in the state, and we think that is an area where um, some changes are needed. The license renewal process for ambulance services uh, lacks any meaningful oversight uh, and should be adjusted. There are no state performance standards for ambulance services, uh, and we recommend that some be put into place. Uh, there are significant uh, problems, in, uh, particularly in outstate Minnesota, with ambulance services that are struggling uh, in terms of staffing and revenue, and we have recommendations along those lines. And lastly, we have some serious concerns about the performance of the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, or EMSRB, and we find in general that they have not uh, been meeting their responsibilities uh, in a variety of areas. So with that quick overview, let me move to uh, giving a little bit of background about ambulance services in Minnesota, just to kind of get us all on the same page. Uh, as of July, 2021, there were 277 ambulance services scattered uh, throughout Minnesota. Um, and those ambulance services provided uh, 650,000 ambulance trips uh, in fiscal year 2021. So that's a lot of services going in a lot of different places. Um, those services have a wide variety of uh, organizational structures. Uh, some have paid staff, some are all volunteer, uh, some have a mix between paid and volunteer staff, and the services are run by a variety of different types of organizations. Some are run by local governments and fire departments, some are run by hospitals and healthcare systems, some are run by nonprofit organizations, and there are some ambulance services that are run by for-profit companies. So we have a wide variety of organizational structures out there in various places in the state. Where you are in the state um, has uh, an impact on what type of ambulance service that you might uh, receive if you call 911 and you need assistance. Uh, there are two types of ambulance services in Minnesota, basic life support and advanced life support. Uh, basic life support service or BLS as it's uh, quickly referred to uh, is generally means that the patient care is going to be provided by emergency medical technicians. This is more basic care. Um, they have only the ability to use very limited set of medications. And this is the type of service that you're more typically gonna find in low population areas. Um, advanced life support service is typically what you're gonna find in higher population areas. Uh, their patient care would be provided by paramedics or persons with paramedic training. Um, and because they have more training, uh, they're able to do more sophisticated procedures um, and administer many more medications. The Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, or EMSRB, is uh, the agency that oversees and regulates uh, ambulance services in Minnesota. They license ambulance services themselves, that is the organizations, uh, and they also certify individuals, uh, paramedics and EMTs uh, who provide patient care. Uh, they are responsible for investigating complaints um, uh, either against services or against individuals. Uh, they inspect ambulance services to make sure that they have the appropriate equipment and documentation and uh, other uh, in, uh, uh, resources that they need. And they also uh, provide grants to regional organizations uh, for overall support of the emergency medical services system. With that very brief background, let me move to talking about our findings because uh, we have a lot of them. I'm gonna kind of go through them fairly quickly. First, I wanna talk about the primary service areas. Um, so these are the geographic areas associated with each ambulance service license. Uh, they were first created as uh, Ms. Randall noted back in the early 1980s. Um, and within <clears throat> the primary service area, ambulance services must ensure coverage uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And they also are required to provide service uh, to anybody within that area, regardless of that individual's ability to pay. Um, so the entire state is essentially divided up into these primary service areas. We have maps of all of the primary service areas in the state in the back of the report. I'm gonna show you just a brief snippet of one here. This is um, primary service areas uh, in the very southern part of the state in Martin and Faribault counties. Uh, you can see that we have uh, dots here showing kind of the towns, uh, uh, Fairmont and Blue Earth are of course the county seats there. And then we have shaded regions and those shaded regions show you where the primary service areas are for each of these different ambulance services. And as you'll note, those primary service areas 
go beyond just the area around the dots. That is, it's not just the city limits uh, where the ambulance service is being provided, but it includes a lot of outlying small towns and townships all around kind of a central point. And that is kind of the fundamental structure of the primary service area system. The idea of putting together low population areas with higher population areas and saying to ambulance services, if you wanna provide service, you have to not only take the higher population area, but you also need to provide it in this larger area as well. Generally speaking, we find that this system has for the most part help to ensure that all Minnesotans have access to ambulances. That tying together of the low population and higher population areas has helped to ensure access. However, we think there are also significant problems with the system. And I wanna talk about two of them today. First of all, the system was never designed to change with the times. Um, those service, there's not a good process for modifying those service areas to take in, into account changes that have happened in population, in transportation, in healthcare, uh, and in all the other things that have happened over the last 40 years. And there is no system to uh, change those service areas going forward over the next 40 years. Uh, the only way in which that can be done is if the ambulance services themselves request changes, and they have not always done so. Additionally, the, whether or not local communities have um, control to decide who provides ambulance service in their communities is tied to decisions that were made way back in the early 1980s. Whoever uh, had ambulance, uh, was running ambulance services at that time applied for licenses and got the primary service areas when they were first developed. And then those, those entities or their successor entities have held on to those ambulance services over time. So we have these odd disparities where um, some cities have local control and some cities do not. St. Paul controls who provides ambulance service uh, in the city of St. Paul, Minneapolis does not. International Falls does, Crookston does not. Red Wing does, Owatonna does not. And we don't think that that, uh, that is a, a good process for the state. So we have uh, broad recommendations with regard to primary service areas. We generally think that the legislature should keep the primary service area system so that we continue to ensure that access is available to ambulance service in all parts of the state, both in a small population and high population areas. But we think that the legislature should restructure how primary service areas are created, modified, and overseen. The legislature should develop a process for periodically reviewing boundaries of ambulance services uh, to see if they should change with the times. Uh, there are several different ways that that could be done. Uh, and we present some ideas for that in the report. And we also think that the legislature should put into place a system for local units of government to have input into who provides service in their primary service areas. And that is not to say that we're suggesting that each individual locality would have control over its ambulance service. We do think tying localities together um, uh, into uh, the primary service area system does make some sense, but there should be some form of local input into who provides service. I wanna move on, Mr. Chair, to talking about licensing now. Um, there are two processes for licensing ambulance services. Uh, the initial licensure process when an ambulance service first begins to provide service in the state of Minnesota. And that is a process that includes public comment and local government input. Um, however, it's a process that is very rarely used because the vast majority of services were licensed uh, decades ago and simply uh, continue to go through the license renewal process. Um, there's only been one ambulance, really brand new ambulance service licensed in Minnesota in the last 10 years. Um, the license renewal process is, it's practically automatic, really. There's not a whole lot of meaningful requirements there. Ambulance services fill out a form and send in a fee and they get their license renewed. Um, they don't need to pass an inspection or to meet any other requirements. Um, in addition, uh, that initial licensure process is not required in some circumstances where there's actually a change in provider in terms of who's providing ambulance service in a particular locality. The, stat, the statutes do not require the initial licensure process to be, uh, to, uh, to be conducted if a license is transferred from one entity to another. Uh, for example, uh, if a larger healthcare system buys out a hospital. Um, and it does not um, have a required li initial licensure process when a license holder that um, decides to stop providing service itself and contract with somebody else to, uh, to provide ambulance service. That has happened in, another, in a number of places in the state. Uh, or if uh, a license holder that does not provide the ambulance service itself switches from one provider to another. Um, 
So we think that there ought to be uh, more use of that initial licensure process. We have two recommendations for the legislature regarding licensing. First of all, we think that there should be um, a little bit more in terms of requirements for the license renewal process. We think, for example, it would be appropriate for ambulance services to have to pass an inspection uh, in order to have their licenses renewed. Um, the legislature could also consider uh, requiring ambulance services to report on how they are performing on performance standards, for example. And I'll get to performance standards in a second. We also think that the legislature should require that ambulance services should go through that initial licensing process with that public comment and local government input process whenever the provider for communities changes from one ambulance service to another. I wanna move now to talking about accountability and performance standards, which I just mentioned I was going to get to. In Minnesota, there are, are quite a few standards that apply to ambulance services, but for the most part, those focus on capabilities, not outcomes. That is, what is it that the ambulance service is able to do or what are um, ambulance service crews, what types of procedures are they able to perform? Do they have the training to perform? But we do not measure outcomes. We do not look to see whether or not, for example, uh, ambulance, serve, uh, ambulance crews have appropriately provided care when uh, certain situations prevent, presented themselves. Uh, EMSRB has the authority in law to set standards like that, um, but it has not done so. Um, but we will note that there are some areas where EMSRB lacks the authority to set uh, standards. And one of those, for example, is response times. That is how quickly ambulance uh, services can get to um, uh, an, an incident after a call comes in from 911. There is, uh, EMSRB does not have the authority to put into place a requirement that say you reach uh, those scenes uh, in 90% of cases within a certain percentage of time. So we have uh, a couple of recommendations with regard to accountability. First of all, we think that the legislature should require EMSRB to go ahead and set and enforce performance standards. It already has the authority to do so, but we think the legislature should require them to do so. However, I will note that that will be a complicated process because the standards that are appropriate for um, very, very busy, large scale metro services are not going to make as much sense for much less busy outstate uh, rural services that have far fewer calls. So that it's going to be a complicated process. It's not easy. Also, we think that uh, EMSRB should work with the legislature to determine whether or not it needs additional authority and statute uh, for some types of performance standards. I wanna move now to talking about uh, the sustainability of ambulance services in uh, Minnesota and particularly in outstate Minnesota. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the presentation, there are a lot of services in Minnesota that are struggling uh, to have enough staff to, have, uh, to get in enough revenue in order to maintain their operations. We surveyed ambulance services uh, throughout the state, all ambulance service directors in the state, and 30% of ambulance service directors told us that they were not confident that their services would be able to meet the needs of their communities five years from now. We thought that was a disturbingly high number, and I will note that the number was even higher for volunteer, all volunteer ambulance services. It was over 40%. Uh, already, in fact, we are seeing instances where services are simply unable to respond to requests for ambulance service at times because they simply do not have anyone on call. And they have to request that the 911 dispatcher uh, uh, shift that call over to a neighboring service um, who can respond, but of course, who will have to come from farther away. The uh, problem of ambulance service sustainability in rural areas is a, is a nationwide problem. It's not just limited to Minnesota. And we do not have a direct recommendation for solving it because um, we don't think that there are good solutions out there that have been tested and have been shown to be successful. However, we do think the legislature should act to try and support struggling ambulance services in outstate Minnesota. And we recommend that it work together with stakeholders, uh, perhaps in a task force setting, to choose some particular strategies and try implementing those on a trial basis. Uh, so perhaps with sunset dates or perhaps doing a pilot project with certain uh, uh, communities and to see whether or not certain strategies are, are in fact being helpful uh, to provide um, services with the more support that they need. And of course, the legislature should be then monitoring whether or not uh, those strategies are working and revisiting those, uh, those uh, laws that are passed uh, when the sunset dates come up to see whether they should be continued or modified or, or, or discontinued. Lastly, I wanna talk about the performance of the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, EMSRB. We have some significant concerns about this agency's performance. 
Uh, the agency does not have a statewide plan or strategy. Um, the sustainability issues have been uh, a problem for a number of years. The board has not taken action uh, to address sustainability issues within the past five, six years. Uh, the board has not updated its regulations in over two decades. Some of the regulations are very antiquated. There are communication standards regarding radios that were put into place in the 1970s and 80s, and nobody is using the equipment that is referred to in those regulations anymore. Um, the uh, EMSRB is not collecting uh, financial data as required by a state law that was passed back in the 1990s. Not only are they not collecting the data, they were not aware that this provision in law existed until we asked them about it. Um, and the, as I noted, primary service areas are a fundamental part of ambulance service licensure, and they haven't even published uh, maps of where those uh, primary service areas are. We are publishing maps in the back of our report, and as far as we are aware, that is the first time that anyone has published maps of where primary service areas in the state are. Um, EMSRB uh, is a board that oversees the actions of an agency with staff, and they simply have not been doing a, a strong job in overseeing the actions of the agency. Um, the primary way in which that is accomplished is through evaluation of the executive director. Um, the board has not conducted a formal evaluation of its executive director in over five years. When the agency was originally founded in 1996, the agency had 17 staff. Um, in recent years, the board has allowed that number to fall to as small as three staff. And as you might expect, with so few staff and uh, such a large set of responsibilities, inspections were not getting done. Investigations were not getting done. Um, and going all the way down to three staff was not a function of the, uh, of the board not having sufficient funds. In fact, EMSRB has returned money to the general fund in each of the last three biennia. In one of those biennia, it returned $1.2 million back to the general fund that it did not spend. So we have quite a few recommendations with regard to the performance of the agency. First of all, we think that the legislature should require EMSRB to create a statewide emergency medical services plan that outlines what the agency is trying to do, who has responsibility to do it, when it's going to happen, um, and then that plan should be updated on a regular basis and the agency should be reporting back to the legislature on how it is meeting uh, the, uh, the plans that it has laid out. We also think that the legislature should uh, require EMSRB to regularly evaluate its executive director. That's not something that is ordinarily put into law, but it's something that the agency has simply not been doing. And so we think the legislature should require them to do it in law. Uh, we have quite a few recommendations for the Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board. They do need to improve the board oversight of the agency. They need to ensure the agency has sufficient staff to carry out its responsibilities. They should begin collecting the financial data that is required by law. They need to update their administrative rules uh, and they should be publishing primary service area maps um, and making those available to stakeholders around the state. More broadly, uh, because of the extent of our findings with regard to EMSRB, we uh, think it is appropriate for the legislature to consider whether or not broader structural changes are needed to the agency. We do not present a specific, uh, particular recommendation here, but we lay out a number of possibilities. Uh, the legislature could consider changing the composition of who sits on the board. We point out, for example, that EMSRB amongst the boards that we compared it to has the smallest proportion of public members of any other board. Um, the legislature could consider requiring term limits for board members. It could move uh, some or all of EMSRB's functions to another agency uh, at the more drastic end of things. Uh, and that, uh, for example, uh, it could uh, push the licensing of organizations of ambulance services uh, to another entity like say the Department of Health and leave um, the, uh, uh, the certification of individuals, of individual EMTs and paramedics to, uh, to the board. Uh, or the legislature could decide to uh, keep things at the status quo. The uh, Emergency Medical Services Regulatory Board, as I'm sure you will hear in a few minutes, is uh, committed uh, to making a number of changes and the legislature could take a wait and see attitude. However, if the legislature does choose to do that, we would encourage um, strong oversight uh, uh, and, and asking the agency to come back to you on a, rec on a regular basis um, so that you can monitor whether or not they are making the changes that are needed. And with that, Mr. Chair, I'm done with my presentation and I would be happy to take any questions. Mr. Chair, you're muted. Sorry. Um, 
Thank you, Mr. Kirshner. And uh, we'll, what we'll do is we'll move on. We have the uh, executive director. Um, let's have Mr. Ferguson um, testify next. And then um, we have the uh, board chair as well. And then we'll do uh, member questions. So Mr. Ferguson, please state your name and your position for the record. Good afternoon, Chairman Curran. Uh, my name is Dylan Ferguson. I serve as the executive director for the EMS Regulatory Board. Uh, I am joined today by board chair uh, J.B. Guyton, um, and J.B. will uh, not have a statement of, its, of his own, uh, but uh, remains available uh, to uh, commission members in the event that there are questions that I am unable to answer. Uh, also, good afternoon to uh, Chairman Hansen and to other members of the commission. Um, before going any further in my testimony this afternoon, I really wanted to, on behalf of the EMSRB, thank Auditor Randall. Uh, and the work of her dedicated staff. I wanna point out that all OLA staff that were assigned to this audit performed their duties uh, professionally and did so with great distinction. Their work highlights some serious and pervasive challenges that face emergency medical services as a whole uh, across the, the state of Minnesota. As evidenced by the 19 recommendations within the report, the challenges facing EMS are many. While some of the recommendations and findings within the report are within the purview of the EMS Regulatory Board, there are many that are not. However, I wish to state that as it relates to the spirit and to the intent of each recommendation, the EMSRB agrees with those recommendations as put forth by the Office of the Legislative Auditor. In response to this audit, the EMSRB has prepared a comprehensive and detailed response letter, which the OLA has graciously included as an appendix to the report in front of you today. The EMSRB is grateful for not only being able to respond in writing, but also to appear before you this afternoon and to take questions. In the interest of timeliness, I will not go through that response letter in detail, but rather focus my testimony today in three separate areas. What work has been accomplished to date? What work is currently ongoing? and what work uh, and a discussion on matters which will ultimately require legislative action to solve. As it relates to accomplishments as of today, recommendation number five highlighted that the EMSRB should ensure that ambulance services meet the requirements in law. The EMSRB primarily works to ensure compliance with the law through a process of investigations and uh, inspections as outlined by Mr. Kirchner in his presentation. The EMSRB has actually been involved, engaged in a multi-year process devoted to making multiple staffing and other structural changes to dedicate additional resources to these core functions. As it stands today, there are currently two FTEs within the agency that are dedicated exclusively to investigations who are supported by an additional FTE compliance analyst. These investigators have worked tirelessly to clear a backlog of previous cases, and an additional three FTEs um, are EMS program specialists who are responsible for covering inspections as a portion of their duties. These multi-year changes have greatly improved the EMSRB's ability to complete investigations and inspections in a much timelier fashion than what the, um, audit, uh, than what the audit period highlighted uh, as the present state in, uh, in in April of 2021. Although there remains additional work to be done in this area as additional financial resources allow. Recommendation number 13 highlighted that the EMSRB should improve its documentation and publication of primary service area boundaries. And the EMSRB steadfastly agrees. While we currently do have PDF maps um, that have been uh, made available to individuals who requested in the past, um, we have heated the o uh, OLA recommendation. And for over a year, actually, the MSRB has been working with Minute on the development of an interactive GIS map, which would make publicly available all PSA boundaries within the state of Minnesota on the EMSRB website. A proof of concept pilot has already been completed uh, for one region of the state, and the EMSRB continues to work with Minute to fully implement this recommendation. Recommendations 15 and 16 relate specifically to the board's oversight and evaluation of the executive director. The board, as part of a strategic redesign of the agency, brought on a contractor with significant background in project management and labor issues. 
the board through this consultant and, th and the board as a whole, just in a process to update the position descriptions, the roles, the respond and the responsibilities of the executive director. All this work was done in conjunction with an employment process of hiring a new executive director. And this is how I came to be appearing before you this afternoon. I'm also pleased to report that Board Chair Guyton has been intently involved with my onboarding, both from an oversight and an orientation perspective. Speaking not only as a new executive director, but generally as a new state employee, I have found this to be extremely helpful in understanding the needs and expanded expectations of the board. The board further recognized as part of its oversight responsibilities, the need for the board to be able to obtain information from multiple perspectives and from an, in control, and from an internal control aspect to not solely rely on the executive director. The organizational structure was revised and each and every single agency employee has a board member liaison to ensure bilateral information exchange and from an internal control aspect to ensure that no one person has all the information. While we're pleased with the progress that has been made, the EMSRB recognizes that additional work remains to be done. Along with the steps already outlined related to the oversight and evaluation of the executive director position, a work group of board members has been charged and continues to work with updating the internal operating procedures of the board, including updating the procedures and establishing an instrument by which to evaluate the which to evaluate my performance as executive director. That work continues with all due haste. There were multiple recommendations within the report, as Mr. Kirchner highlights, that related to performance measures. There has been disagreement and multiple interpretations related to the board's authority to implement performance measures, and to a greater extent, what actions the board could or could not take if those performance measures were not met. The EMSRB is currently evaluating the concept of performance measures right now from a point of definition of what potential measures could look like, information, and a data collection point of view. Additionally, related to data, recommendation number nine asks the EMSRB to consider reporting mechanisms to track non-responses of ambulance services. Those instances which were highlighted previously where uh, a service can't respond due to a lack of staffing. This is a challenge that state EMS offices across the country face. The current data collection processes that exist really focus on activity that actually occurs. In few locations is dispatch data directly linked with patient care reporting data. We did utilize existing data to try to determine what if any conclusions that we could draw uh, related to this recommendation. And we found that the reported frequency of mutual aid utilization increased in 42 of Minnesota's counties when we compared data from 2020 to 2021. We know as of today unequivocally that that data is an undercount. More complete and reliable information related to this recommendation would likely require data from 911 centers, which is currently not a capability or authority that the EMSRB currently has at our disposal. However, as with all the recommendations contained in this report, the EMSRB looks forward to the opportunity to work with the Minnesota legislature in moving forward and implementing the recommendations highlighted in this report. Finally, as it relates to recommendation number 12 of updating administrative rules in chapter 4690, for many years, the perceived expense and instances of incorrect and erroneous information delayed the strategic priority of updated rulemaking. Both the board and staff have been heavily involved with researching the rulemaking and sonar process and commit to avail itself of all available resources and to strongly consider updates and revisions to chapter 4690. As this report highlights, there are numerous areas related to the administration of the EMS system that only the legislature has the power to address. The EMSRB agrees wholeheartedly with many of these recommendations which are directed towards the legislature. 
A prime example relates to the addressing the overlap uh, problem of primary service areas. The EMSRB shares in the frustration of the EMS community and the OLA auditors as it relates to the PSA process overall and the fact that, um, and the fact of these situations in which there's overlap. We look forward to be working with the legislature to empower the EMSRB to be able to address those types of issues, which currently we're not legally permitted to address. Related to many of the other issues, many laws related to EMS, as Auditor Randall highlighted, have not been significantly updated for many years. And an evaluation and a broad discussion of various sections of 144E including board composition, would be welcomed by the EMSRB. In closing, as it relates to the general sustainability um, and the EMS industry overall, the EMSRB implores in the strongest of terms for the legislature to, to consider additional funding sources for emergency medical services agencies, both within the Metro and in outstate Minnesota, in both the short term and to assist in identifying sustainable funding solutions for the intermediate and long-term to ultimately ensure the viability of critical public health and public safety services across Minnesota. As the state's lead EMS agency with a renewed commitment, we stand at the ready to provide whatever assistance, support, and information that we can to assist this legislature in ensuring the continued provision of high quality emergency services throughout the state. Once again, Chairman Curran, thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. And at this point, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. And on our list, we have uh, Senator Kiffmeyer first and then Representative Hansen, um, traveling via phone, um, will be second. So Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chair. I appreciate the opportunity to uh, comment here. Uh, probably my question is for you, Mr. Guyton. So my question for you is the ultimate responsibility here is for the board and you as chair of the board. Yes, ma'am. Uh, your mm -hmm. oversight to the employees of the board is your responsibility and to comply with all of those laws. My question for you is it sounds like because we've been doing this audit over the past year. So over this past year, which is normal, uh, entities who are being audited such as this from the OLA start getting to work on the issues that are already being brought up. But my question for you, Mr. Guyton, uh, what was happening prior to the OLA starting its audit and the situation there that there was no performance review of the executive director for five years, Mr. Ferguson is new, um, can you just tell more about a little bit about the history of the board and your responsibility with the board on the oversight? Um, excellent question. Thank, thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Mr. Guyton, please state your name and your position uh, for uh, the record. Sure, J.B. Guyton, G-U-I-T-O-N, uh, chair of the board of the EMSRB. Um, so Senator Kiffmeyer, if I can go ahead, chair. Mr. Guyton, go ahead. Senator Kiffmeyer, uh, I think there's several things you need to know. First of all, the board does not have oversight over the employees and not historically been allowed to do that. The board has oversight of the executive director who has oversight of the employees. Mm -hmm. And that is based on, yeah. So um, that would lead to some of the challenges we've had in the past. Um, and that's why we took action uh, earlier this last year, actually, in trying to create relationships between board members and employees with the liaison uh, effort that Dylan talked about, Mr. Ferguson talked about. Um, we had numerous efforts to do a formal evaluation of the executive director um, and learned we needed to totally redo our process. We have a group that's been working on that for quite some time. We identified many of these issues before we knew uh, the OLA was even doing an audit. Um, and we were already working on solutions prior to that, but most of those things that started to happen to improve what we were doing happened after the end of the audit period. We also went out of the way to make sure we cooperated with all the levels of the audit so it could come out as accurate and we could make the improvements that we, want, we needed to make. 
So we had identified that was an issue. Um, and does that answer your question, Senator Kiffmeyer? Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Somewhat, Mr. Guyton. I just want to clarify, having dealt with many boards with executive directors and other staff, the board directs the executive director to collect information on the staff and bring it forward to the board. Um, liaisons are, are informational, and uh, that's always a good thing, too. But ultimately, uh, if the executive director is not doing its job, it is the board who holds them accountable through performance reviews, uh, other measures that are available to you under law, and to make sure that um, that position is fulfilling the statutory duties. But the board itself has ultimate responsibility for that and for holding that executive director accountable. When I hear about some of these things and the length of time it is taking to do it, uh, it concerns me that it would take so long because uh, the board itself uh, should be able to be more responsive. But oftentimes the executive director can be very cooperative or not be so cooperative. Uh, for what I'm hearing today from Mr. Ferguson, it seems as though your choice here of hiring him as a new executive director, he seems to be more, um, hopefully will be more attentive to the statutes, uh, to the requirements, to following through and thus making your job as a chair and the board as a whole uh, more compliant with what's here. I'm less concerned about all these districts. Um, I, I'm aware I served on a hospital district board. <laughs> So this is almost like school districts. Try and, try and change school district boundaries. If you really want to open up a uh, ant storm, you will find between parents, teachers, and superintendents, it will get really complicated. I'm concerned about the care of the patient's response times. But being on the board, I work with the ambulance service as well to communicate with my township. And in fact, when we did a study, uh, we found by working with the 911 center and getting all the data, we were able to get that data with the ambulance service, no problem whatsoever. And we were able to get that data and prove to our township their response times in the township were as good or better than North Memorial Trauma Hospital. And so it's really important to have those objective kinds of studies, but I'm puzzled that you cannot have a effort with the 911 centers, which is critical because the phone call comes into 911 and thereafter there is a marker every single step of the way to the time when the patient is brought back or not, whatever the result of that is. Those are very objective matters and should be readily available in working with uh, EMSRB. But what I see, Mr. Guyton, is really more of a a failure here of the structure of the MSRB. Uh, if that's not functioning right, messing around with districts or doing any other thing to me is a waste of effort. Until you get the house in order of your actual board, um, then all of that uh, and putting more money into it. We talk about some of these things, but many of these ambulance districts have hospitals, they have uh, a variety of entities who have, they really have the ultimate responsibility uh, for doing that. I don't want to go in the direction of money when uh, the board itself and its duties and responsibilities are not even well in hand. Um, I, Mr. Chair, I would very much um, like to uh, see this be given a year and have another report I don't know just exactly what the OLA does with this. And you and I have had some discussions about how to follow up with this. Uh, but until there is some structural effort and reform within the MSRB as a whole together, working with fees or changing some of that is a concern to me. And I think some of those structural things have to go first. But the most important thing is patient care. I'm familiar with many times mutual aid. Uh, so I was on the board, there was a bus accident. There were children greatly harmed, deaths. And we had to use St. Cloud, Monticello, Mercy, Buffalo. We had to use them all because there were too many patients for anyone to take them. That is not a sign of a broken system. That's a sign of a successful system. 
And so that mutual aid is really crucial. Same thing with fire departments, same thing with law enforcement and their effort to work together. And I appreciate Representative Novotny working on more training using multiple law enforcement entities so they get used to how to work that through together. But it ultimately has to come from the MSRB. And even in some of these um, updating some of these laws, really the board, your executive director, uh, should work together and making recommendations to the legislature. I work with many other ones and the good ones see those things and bring recommendations to the legislature where they've worked with all the stakeholders and they they bring some of that through. That's really not the job of the legislature other than to say, go do it. But I want to tell you, the best thing is when the board and the executive does it without us having to be the heavy hand and say, go do it. Um, and But if that's what it takes, we'll do it. Uh, right now, I appreciate some of the things you've done, but I would certainly like to see an updated report and answers to all of those questions uh, next year at the latest. And those are some of my comments, Mr. Chair, just to kind of kick it off. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. I'm I don't know that there was a question in there. Um, so, Mr. Well, they can reply to it, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, Mr. I think it, it's, yes, it is comments to all that, but um, the question is, what are your thoughts about that? Well, first of all, I would welcome your, oh, sorry, uh, Chair. Um, I would welcome uh, the thought to come back in a year and check again, because I know the changes that we've already instituted. And um, we take the EMS industry in the state of Minnesota uh, uh, very strongly, very, and we need it to survive. Um, I, I wanna share a little of my history with you, just so you know my understanding of EMS. I, I became an EMT in 1981. Um, I uh, became a paramedic in 1984. So prior to the EMSRB existing and prior to PSAs, primary service a agencies existed, and I know what a mess it was. And I know in the huge department at that time of, of Department of Health, um, we were a little speck on their radar. And that's why the legislation came forward, eventually establishing the EMSRB in 1995. And we inherited all the statutes and rules that were in place at that time. Um, I believe that there's plenty of areas that we're gonna need some legislative help on, but I'd also share with you, we have brought bills forward and asked for legislative help for four years in a row and have had no response from legislature. And until very recently, mm -hmm. even though there's been two ex officio members on the board, right now, the last two years is the first time we've had both the Senate and the House members show up at meetings almost every single time. Before then, I couldn't have even pointed some of our representatives and senators out from a lineup. I, I had no idea what they even looked like because they never showed up for meetings. Um, it is one of the beauties of virtual world is it makes it much more possible, even if they're touring some part of the state to join us. And, and mm -hmm. um, both our current Senator um, and our current uh, Andrew Lang and our current representative John Hewitt are very active uh, as members of the board. And, and have a, I would say a special concern on where EMS goes in the future. Um, you mentioned primary service, oh, you mentioned mutual aid. That's the one I wanted to talk to. Our concern is not normal health and mutual aid. And that's what you're mentioning. Mm -hmm. Our concern is when a city says, we can't cover our service area Monday through Friday, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. So we need the next community 30 miles over to do it. And I think that's what um, <clears throat> uh, Mr. Uh, Kirchner was talking about was, it's not the healthy mutual aid of we're overwhelmed, we need help. It's actually planned, we're out of business for the day that causes the problem. And unfortunately in rural parts of Minnesota, I mean, when these laws were written in 84, nobody could have conceived volunteerism would wane and, and start to go away. Nobody can conceive some of the sizes of the ambulance services that we have today and how that's helped in some areas. Um, some could argue might not have helped in other areas. And it's been really frustrating that we don't have the authority to do some things that we'd like to have the authority to do. And one big one is, yes, we can collect um, data, but we have no enforcement power to do anything about it. So all we become is a data collection point at that point. And that's one of the things we actually, for the first time in history, probably in the last five years, have really started to collect EMS data. Part, partially, it wasn't even possible other than dispatch 
um, information to collect it until recently because there was no mechanism to do it. But with the onset of electronic records, we actually get most agencies' uh, times, their treatments, all that happening within um, sometimes within minutes of the run, but definitely at least a couple times a month. So we would love to not only take performance measures, but have the ability to enforce what happens with those. And with our uh, discussions with our AAG in the past, um, it's been interpreted we don't have that authority. Um, so there might be some other opinions. I'm not a lawyer, so I want to make that very clear. Uh, PSAs has been another really frustrating thing. And and um, yeah, Mr. Kirscher talked about the overlaps and just, or he talked about PSAs, he didn't talk much about overlaps, but we have parts of the state that have these huge overlaps. And a couple of years ago, uh, we had a situation where we were reviewing a license and it was the perfect time to take over and discuss PSAs and clear up a problem that was 30 years old. This happened in 1984, this issue. And we don't have the authority, it turned out, according to AAG, we didn't have the authority to clean up that overlap. And it's something, as Mr. Kirshner pointed out, the, sign, the system was not designed to change in the future. And when we say change, we mean this is your licensed area and it is your licensed area. So um, that's where we're looking for legislative help is to give the board the authority that it needs. Uh, Mr. Kirshner also said something else that I think is really important and chair of the board, this might surprise you. Um, I would agree the board should be potentially restructured. When we originally presented the idea of the EMSRB uh, back in the early 1990s, there were originally seven members was our suggestion of the board, we, including our two ex officio, we have 19 members on our board. And, and it just makes it hard to get, uh, you know, a good decision or even get through a meeting sometimes with 19 people present uh, and able to vote and talk and discuss. Um, and quite frankly, sometimes educate uh, because even though it may appear that a lot of people are industry people, a lot of them really aren't. Um, they just are tied in with an employer who happens to own an ambulance even though they work for a hospital. And, and the problem's so bad that our public health nurse, our public health position which has a very tight definition of what that person can be, that position has been unfilled for over a year. And we have worked closely with the governor's office to try and recruit people for that. But it, it is a very weird definition of who can fill that. And, and it just makes it really hard. So I personally would welcome a smaller board. Um, go ahead, sorry, Chair. Mr. Gates. Mr. Chair, if I could respond to that. Senator Kiffmeyer, if it could be quick, because we do have yep. uh, Representative Hansen, Erickson, and Quam in the queue. Sorry. Yeah. Senator Kiffmeyer. I just wanted to say, if we could, I, I really am sorry that you put forward four bills and there was no action to them. I don't, we never really understand totally why, but it, I would like to have a list of those four bills and to be able to follow up with you. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. We would agree. Um, so, Mr. Guillotin, because that was one of my questions. Uh, you had a legislative committee or work group, so we would please make that information available. And, and I should uh, clarify, it was the same attempt to clean up the law four times that we tried to introduce it. So thank you. Excellent. And we'll get thank that you. to you. We'll get thank that you, Mr. Geaton. Um, Representative Hanson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I wanna uh, uh, congratulate the audit commission uh, or audit staff for this thorough audit. Uh, you know, I was thinking all of the years I've been on the audit commission uh, this is one of the most stunning and appalling audits I've heard, uh, particularly when it deals with emergency response and patient care. You know, we're dealing with people uh, at, the, at crises in their life, and we have a structure that could not evolve, that cannot evolve. Um, you know, as Senator Kiffmeyer mentioned, we often see agencies that um, get the information that they're going to audit, they start to adapt. I have I have uh, sympathy for the new executive director. Uh, you are walking, in, you walked into a house fire here and uh, it's not a question of cleaning house. I think uh, we have to start over. And so my question is in order to start over uh, to the chair of the board and any other board members, uh, would they resign uh, so that we can begin a new process of serving the people of Minnesota? Uh, uh, in helping out with emergency services. Thank you, Representative Hanson. Um, 
Mr. Ferguson or Mr. Guillotin, who would like to respond to Representative Hanson? Uh, I feel that as, as chair, um, I wish I could show you what we've done in the past year. Um, and we'll get there, I think. Uh, but at this point, I have a mission to complete. Uh, my term ends this year. Uh, I do not imply and I do not intend to apply again. Um, and uh, but I would be subject to discussing that with with the right uh, people. But I I feel the changes that we've made um, really are turning this agency around. And I think the important thing is, and I think there's some misunderstanding here, right or wrong on what we've been doing. EMS in the Minnesota, patients are being taken care of every single day and being taken care of well. We have an EMS system that's looked at uh, from many other states uh, as a, a premier EMS system. And I think that's part of what we need to know is, yes, do we need a tune-up? Yes, do we need the change? Yes, do we need to improve? Um, but our EMTs and paramedics and first responders in the state of Minnesota are absolutely amazing. And Thanks. Thanks, yeah. Mr. Geaton. Uh, and Representative Hanson, follow up? Just to follow up, you know, and I appreciate that. And I, uh, if you are at the end of your term uh, making suggestions, and I'd be willing to talk with you on that. I think when I go back to this as a case study and regulatory capture, and I, I, I sympathize with your comment on finding difficulty, we as, as legislators over the last 30 to 40 years have um, set up a system, hold on just a second, set up a system where uh, with boards where we lane the membership. We, we say this group has this member, this group has a member. And uh, you know, I think the audit mentioned that there's only one public member. So we lose sight of the public purpose and we focus on the stakeholder purpose. So as the stakeholder term has been embedded into statute and into boards, people come to that uh, uh, from a role of representing an interest rather than representing the public. And I think that this has hobbled our ability to evolve because the easiest thing to do is to protect the status quo. The easiest thing to do is to protect your interest. And uh, Mr. Guyton, you and I are, are probably roughly the same age. A lot has changed in the last 40 years uh, since 1981. And, uh, but if your membership doesn't change or your structure doesn't change and evolve, uh, then it has a hard time being nimble enough to provide the service. And I do think, uh, you know, if there's no map, if the legislative auditor has to be the first one to, pr to print the map of the service areas, we've got a problem. Uh, with today's technology. And so, uh, you know, I am pleased, you know, that's a very blunt question I asked and I would ask it of the other board members too. Uh, but th your answer is a good answer because it shows an openness to evolving. Thank you. Mr. Chair, can I answer one more thing? Mr. Geaton. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, very much appreciate those uh, comments. I should tell you, um, I'm not considered a member of the public, but I am a retired EMS commander and have uh, from the city of Woodbury, uh, from a city-based government and uh, have no allegiance to anybody in my decision and moving forward and, and uh, do not have any special interests. The original concept of the board was, uh, if I remember right, um, three citizens and four EMS related people. Thank you, Mr. Gaten. Representative Hanton, any other follow-up? Nope, thank you. All right, excellent. We'll move on to uh, Representative Erickson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And first of all, thank you to the auditors who have completed a very thorough and complete uh, analysis of what's going on in our emergency ambulance services 
you know, I think until we started ha having EMTs or paramedics serve in the legislature, this issue didn't rise to the concern that it should have long ago. Uh, so I'm so grateful that we've had Representative Backer, Representative Hewitt, uh, be able to inform us of some of the needs within uh, this uh, very important service that we provide. Uh, so thank you auditors for this. And uh, I want to, uh, to ask Mr. Guyton uh, a question, if I may, please. Representative Erickson, go ahead. Mr. Guyton. Yes, ma'am. Uh, so who oversees this particular board? Is it the Department of Health? No, uh, we are an independent board and we report to, uh, I believe it's the Health and Human Services of the Senate and the, leg and the, the legislature is probably the best way to say that. Okay, thank, thank you. So it's, so it's, thank you, Mr. Chair. So it's a health and human services. Well, you know, uh, this, this is a, a very urgent concern to me about statutory language that is obsolete, that isn't meeting the needs. And I really feel for this board. I mean, I know they've had some missteps over the years, but it, you know, we at the legislature also have to pay attention to as uh, to time changing and to obsolete uh, language that's embedded in, if, for example, our boards. So, you know, my concern is that, you know, I serve mostly on education committees and we are always on the case of the department to take a look at laws that are obsolete and get them out of statute, revise them or whatever. So, you know, I'm concerned that HHS, uh, knowing that they, they have this, huge responsibility to so many because emergency services, ambulance services serve so many that, you know, uh, noting how times have changed and that statutory language needs to change, you know, I would hope they pay attention to that. Now we will, of course, because we've had this audit. Uh, but I, I do want to thank um, Representative Hewitt, Representative Backer for their services and, and for calling attention to, because that's how we got this audit, was that we had these men serving in our legislature who could see that we needed to take a close look at the operation of the board, but also these services and how they were being, I mean, I've, I've listened to Representative Backer so many times talk about how he has been extended, and I think he's basically a volunteer, but he's been all over his area servicing. And, you know, he was serving in the legislature, he owns a business, and he was doing this and God bless him. But I could tell that he was really stretched and concerned about whether or not we, they were serving uh, our, our um, constituency uh, in the way that we should. So uh, I thank you um, for testifying today and to the executive director and assure you that we'll take a look at the statutory language. Uh, I know that um, if you brought forth bills in the past, um, they should uh, uh, arise to the top again so that we can look at that. And, and perhaps we need, as, Rep as Senator Kiffmeyer said, a year to take a look at how um, we can make further changes after we see how some of these adjustments will work. So I really don't have a question other than to make that statement about the statutes are outdated and we need to take a look at them and, and to thank you and, uh, of course, to thank the auditors for their excellent work again. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman, Representative Erickson. And, Chairman uh, Curran, may I, re may I yep. respond, sir? Yep. Uh, Mr. Ferguson, I was going to go to you next. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, Representative Erickson, I just wanted to, to highlight um, that you know, kind of as we said with those previous bills. Uh, but the one thing I also want to highlight is that I do not think that previously, um, with the previous structure of the EMSRB and perhaps uh, previous individual uh, personalities or processes, I, I don't, from the outsider's view looking in, I don't think that perhaps the EMSRB was um, as involved directly with uh, members of the Minnesota legislature as maybe we would uh, have seen with other types of uh, state EMS offices across the country. Um, in the three weeks that I've been here, um, you know, I've already had an opportunity to meet several times with Representative Hewitt. I had the opportunity to uh, meet with Representative Backer. Um, and really, it is the intent and my charge from the board and from the board chairman um, to be involved with you and to be there to answer questions and to really try to develop those better relationships so we can do exactly what you said of, of try to move 
um, some of these modernizing bills together. And uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, we, we certainly look forward to kind of providing you with uh, some of the bills that have been put forth previously. And I also wanted to just take a brief moment to highlight that we do have um, a bill uh, currently pending both in the Senate and the House, uh, which would grant the EMSRB the um, authority to be able to grant uh, a level of uh, relief, if you will, uh, to some of those EMS agencies in outstate Minnesota uh, from a staffing point of view uh, as a way to provide some relief in the short term while we work through these more intermediate and these long-term challenges. So that's all that I had. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. I think all of us as legislators would be looking forward to, you know, what is on the plate today. Some things will be clearly obvious that we, we need, may need to grant the board some, uh, some latitude to do the things necessary. Um, and welcome in your 21 days uh, as, the, as the executive director to, uh, to a glowing report. Um, it, it, it highlights some challenges clearly probably the most recommendations I've seen as far as um, uh, operationally, organizationally, and statutory uh, recommendations that I've seen in the report uh, to date in my short time here at the legislature. And so um, we, we will all work together to make sure that these critical services get, about, get taken care of. Um, it, it, we have massive um, challenges, but it sounds like they've been identified uh, and appreciate the, the work that was done by the, the OLA and the staff. So, uh, we have Representative Kwam next. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, over a decade ago, when I was a freshman, I was on an EMS RB. Uh, and back then, a big emphasis was, well, well frankly, we had the community paramedic uh, bill that came out of that uh, group. And we, we moved it forward. And it was an access type um, you know, trying to address and expand the access. Um, I've got family members that were on a volunteer ambulance service and also um, on a first responder group, which uh, augmented the uh, Rochester-based ambulance so that we get out there and uh, so, saw the patient and did some care before the ambulance was able to arrive. So there are a lot of different mixes and different types of organizations. Um, so it's a very complex thing. And I, as we look at implementing some of these suggestions, we need to allow for local uh, options to best meet and address. Um, and I always thought, you know, when I attended the meetings, I always thought part of the duty of the legislators in those meetings was to be the public voice and, and to be the uh, back and forth communicator with the legislature and, and, the, and the oversight. Um, and I think uh, Representative Hewitt with, I've attended a few of his regional uh, meetings that he's had with local first responders, ambulance service and um, you know, related people. I, I, I think that a joint HHS style um, informational meeting by both chambers um, would be a great way to move forward with this. And I, and I hope that the chairs uh, look at this, this audit report and use it as a, uh, a guide for that and bring forth a testimony. But again, the, the auditor is helping us shine a light on things we need to address. And in this busy world, I, I think it's really good function that's being performed here. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Kwam and, and uh, Senator Kiffmeyer and I have been sharing the same, very same thought on um, Mr. Geaton talked about um, or Guyton talked about the things that have been identified and what, the, what they've already started to work on in, in, in the duration of the report went on. Um, and, uh, and I believe Mr. Ferguson still doesn't even have his feet wet yet. So we're gonna need that update. And again, I think out of that, uh, I think some things that will pop up that we can do this year and as well as look and see um, what are the things that we, we 
you to look at, be aware of as, as you go to implement or, or take the recommendations and put them into practice. So with that, Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Those are uh, excellent points as well, and I appreciate all of that. But I'm more of a considering what time we're in right now that I would prefer to say to Mr. Guyton and Mr. Ferguson, uh, the board chair, and for you to work to go through this report. I would say that at this time, to grant the board more authority considering this audit would be extremely difficult to get through the legislature. It'd be very difficult to justify that. But what I think is doable in this legislature is to go through those points in the auditor's report, such as board structure. I, I can't quite list all of those findings that would pertain to that. But for you, Mr. Guyton, Mr. Ferguson, to work on that and work with um, Senator Lang and uh, Representative Hood and Baker, those legislators you already have, they are your readier legislators and knowledgeable to work together with them to pick those things out of this OLA report that directly affect and help us have confidence with this board. Uh, to do that and present that, I would certainly, um, and Senator Coran and the rest of us as well, to follow up with you to help and assist in getting some of those things done. And so I'm not quite sure what the other bills may have been, but more authority uh, under this audit, I think would be extremely difficult. I think the other points that help to um, help you in your board structure, variety of recommendations were there. Let's see if we can do some of that. I want, I, the whole purpose of the Legislative Audit Commission is to give this a hearing. I know that HHS, they have their agendas quite full, things like that, getting a joint meeting, certainly if they can do that in. I want to put my eggs in a basket. I would like to see this uh, have rather use the time that you do that work, prepare that bill language, and then use that bill hearing as an opportunity to talk about what's happening. And then you have some actual language on the agenda at a hearing uh, to move on. And that would be my recommendation to you, Mr. Guyton, and to uh, you working with Mr. Ferguson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Kiffmeyer. Uh, Mr. Kirshner. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to briefly uh, note uh, that, uh, and to thank Representative Liebling uh, for having us in her committee. She's gonna have us in her committee on Monday uh, to talk uh, briefly. I think she's fitting us in around a number of other things, but I appreciate her willingness to, to try and get us in uh, as soon as possible uh, in her committee. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kirshner, for the update. And uh, um, with that, Representative Lieber. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And um, Mr. Kirshner, thank you for noting that. I, I did want to note that as well. And uh, I just want to especially extend my appreciation to Senator Kiffmeyer. We have uh, a lot of the same thinking here, and I am grateful to you, you know, obviously uh, bipartisan and bicameral, which is the beauty of this committee, this commission. And we, uh, I am very grateful to Mr. Kirshner and, uh, and uh, Auditor Randall and their staffs who worked on this. This is a really important report. And um, this is our process working the way it should. It's unfortunate that it's been so long with this board and with uh, the issues that are here. And, um, but, uh, you know, this is um, obviously one of the things about this report, and I told Mr. Kirshner, I'm going to read this report with a marker and a, you know, pen and uh, very, very carefully. Um, one of the issues here is this is a really complicated system and a complicated process, and yet it is super important for the public. And I think it was Senator Kipmeyer who said, this is about the patients. And yes, it is. And, you know, we need to really look at this uh, without, you know, as some, somebody likes to say, without fear or favor. And with our complete attention on what is best for the patients of Minnesota to make sure we get the service where we need it, when we need it, and at a reasonable cost, by the way. So, you know, I really look forward to digging into this. It's kind of too bad that we don't have more time left in the session. I'm sure this is going to be a multi-year effort, but I'm certainly hoping that we can get something done this year 
Um, and I know with, with Representative Hewitt's help, he's been tremendous in pushing this along and, and informing me about what's going on and just appreciate everyone's help that we should, this is a really an urgent issue as we all know. So I just want to thank you everyone for your attention to this and more to come. Thank you, Representative Liebling. And uh, with that members, um, it, not that um, Mr. Ferguson or Mr. Geaton need more help, but I think one of the things that was highlighted is the rural service areas in staffing and volunteerism. And, you know, as we, I think it was very clear, the uh, five years out, nobody's confident that, you know, that we're going to have, a, have a, an ambulance service available. So I, I notice on all of your committees or, or your task force uh, committees and work groups, um, volunteerism is not on one of those topics. I'm sure it's embedded in a, multiple subjects there, yeah. but um, you know, we have this challenge across the, uh, across the nation that we have a younger generation is not getting involved in, this, in filling our volunteer fire departments, which are those members um, and EMS side for that rural. Um, as that conversation goes on, we would really love to that. Not that you don't have enough to do, but it is one of those key areas that, that it is, has some focus and we can all get together and, and figure out some creative ways to make it more enticing to do that type of work. So yeah, totally. Mr. Agree. Oh yeah. Sorry about that chair. Uh, totally agree. And um, I, I would give him a perfect example of that since we talked about representative backer and he's been so supportive of EMS uh, and was a member of the MSRB in the past along with represent. Um, um, I think the important thing is if you look at an agency like his, a small town in Western Minnesota, if I understand right, during the day, there are three responders and Representative Backer is one of them. So every time he's in St. Paul, um, I think it's his brother actually, and one other person, and, and he could speak about this much better than I can, but uh, our rural agencies are, really hurting. And um, it's a shame that when the MSRB was put together, it was never a charge to the MSRB um, to do anything to support the industry in that way. Uh, however, we have taken it upon ourselves to do what we can do um, and try and fix a problem nobody else in the world can fix, as you mentioned, with volunteerism. But uh, they need help and we need to help them. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Gay. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ferguson. Thank you. Um, and kind of as it relates to that, um, the board kind of indirectly uh, really tries to support those recruitment and those retention aspects, particularly related to volunteerism with the administration of those grant funds to our eight regional EMS programs, which are incorporated throughout the entire state. Um, so I, I just also wanted to point out that it was not that there isn't any work that there isn't any work being done on that. It's just, it is done more, it is more done organically um, at that more local, that more regional level. Um, and, and certainly, you know, the MSRB works to, you know, coordinate with those regional programs, uh, you know, where there are common interests um, and where are, the, are those, uh, those common pain points, if you will. So I just wanted to take a moment to point out that important part of the system as well, because I think that really speaks to the, the recruitment and the retention issue. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Ferguson. And uh, I see no hands. And so what I'd like Mr. to do- Mr. Chair. Say, oh, Senator Kiffmeyer. <laughs> yeah, uh, Mr. Chair, I just, I think it was important right now though to address the fact there's some talk about the legislature not paying attention. And I would say in order to get this topic as on the, we have to come down to five or six topics out of 150 or so. And the legislature puts forward these topics and bicamerally, both the House, Senate, and bipartisanly choose these topics. The fact that this topic could get chosen out of all of those demonstrates the fact that the legislature was paying attention, but we don't have the time to do the kind of work that the OLA does. But we, as and I'd say a board of the House and Senate, and through the Audit Commission, uh, make these kinds of things work. And I just want to say that 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 is an important thing. And I also want to commend you in the word that I heard that in through all this, it's a board structure. A lot of these things are done, but also making sure that we focus that the patients in the meantime, we're being cared for. And that is really 
a, a strong point for us to remember in the midst of working to improve uh, this agency. Thank you. Thank you, Seneca Meyer. And again, thank you everybody and, and our members for, for bringing this forward. Um, we made it through the selection process. It was great work by Mr. Kirshner and the entire team. Yes, Ms. Randall, you guys have done a great job. Uh, we will look forward to the briefing and, you know, between Mr. Ferguson and Ge Mr. Geaton on what are those things that are in place and we'll work alongside you and make sure that these things get taken care of. So uh, with that members, there's no further business before us today. Thank Mr. everybody Chair. for participating. Uh, Ms. Mr. Randall, closing, closing comments. Um, thank you. Yes, I, I do just want to thank members for their attention and for understanding how important this report is. We do appreciate that. I also just wanted to remind you that today is the last day to submit your topics for the next round of evaluations. Um, and so I know many of you have already gotten those topics into us, but just a reminder, um, we kick off the process again um, early next week with the next um, evaluation subcommittee meeting on Tuesday. So um, if you have ideas, if your members have ideas, please make sure to get them to us today. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Ms. Randall. I have um, my LA. Um, making sure to contact every single Senate or office in our caucus to uh, make sure that their staff to get the, uh, uh, their ideas submitted by the end of today. So thank you for the update. And again, thank you, everybody. Uh, this brings the Legislative Audit Commission um, to the end, and we're adjourned. Thank you.